the editor of Annals of Internal Medicine asked us to look into the evidence that had recently accumulated about um, the um, uh, care of patients with type 2 diabetes, specifically how tight should their sugar control be. Up to this point, there were few large trials of sugar control in patients with diabetes. And uh, in the course of a couple of months last year, uh, three large trials announced their results and put together, multiplied the amount of evidence available almost by five. Um, but it's, uh, the results were disappointed to, disappointing to some, surprising to many, and so it was time to summarize it and put it all together for uh, clinicians. And so that's what we did. Put together, the results essentially show uh, three things. The first one is that tight sugar control uh, does not uniformly lead to better outcomes for patients with diabetes, particularly when one pays attention to the outcomes that matter to patients. Uh, so will I live longer, feel better, and live unhindered by complications of the disease or the treatment? When we look at that, uh, it's clear that uh, tight sugar control in general uh, does not reduce mortality, uh, does not reduce the risk of heart attacks or strokes or amputations, and does not reduce the risk of going blind, requiring dialysis, uh, dying from kidney causes, or having uh, nerve problems. The second point is that uh, hemoglobin A1C, which is a measure that we obtain in the clinic and we use uh, with patients to inform the quality or the extent of sugar control, if you lower that one, you don't see a direct correlation with improvement in outcomes in these studies. Um, and there's a, the current policy is to push for hemoglobin A1Cs of less than 7%, and patients with diabetes know that they should better have their sugars down so that that A1C measure that their doctor will obtain every three to six months will be less than 7%. Otherwise, they'll get scolded by their doctor. Well, these studies don't show that, pursue, show that if you pursue that, what you're going to get is an increased risk of low blood sugars, some weight gain, but again, not, it's very difficult to show any benefit from that strategy. Um, and so the third point that I, that I draw from this is that it is time to change the way we're thinking, given how the data has turned out. And um, that changing thinking comes in two ways. First of all, it's time to emphasize in patients with diabetes other things uh, that are not just sugar control. These patients die fundamentally of cardiovascular disease, so treating their cardiovascular disease, emphasizing their wellness, their ability to cope with chronic disease, their adherence to effective therapies, and their treatment of their cholesterol and blood pressure should be the thing that we should spend most of our time in. Uh, spending our time in improving sugar control from good enough to super tight it does not lead to better outcomes, and it's, it's actually very hard and introduces a lot of expense and burden of treatment to patients. And uh, the other piece of this is that policymakers who have who are generally been interested in improving the quality of care for people with diabetes have picked on hemoglobin A1C as a way of, of determining somebody's doing a good job. And so clinicians have been ha held accountable in terms of their diabetes control to achieving that hemoglobin A1C less than 7% in their patients. And um, the data doesn't support uh, a uh, the same goal for every patient, and uh, clinicians uh, should be given enough leeway to have the conversation with the patients that will allow to individualize those goals on a patient-by-patient -patient basis, paying attention to their context, and what patients are willing to do for potential, but again, not fully realized benefits of, to, of, sharp, of tight sugar control. So um, I think it's time for a measure of accountability of diabetes control that is either not related to sugar or if it's going to continue to be that hemoglobin A1C, it should be pushed up so that there will be more room for patients and clinicians to have uh, flexibility and individualize those goals for their patients. So one one, one uh, sh way of uh, clearly thinking about the results that we found in this study is that the plots that we show do not look like the plots that you will see, for instance, for statins. When you do a, the same analysis for statins, what you see is a consistent reproducible benefit that is of a magnitude that matters and outcomes that patients will value. Not a whole lot of debate there. Um, these results don't look like that at all. The, 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 the findings are uh, of benefits that are potentially negligible or non-existent or 
irrelevant. And, uh, and the effort, well, on the statin is just you take a tablet, end of story. In this one, many patients take multiple tablets many times a day. Some of them take insulin injections many times a day. And some of them are asked by their clinician to be checking their own blood sugars once or more times per day. And, uh, and this, the, all this burden of treatment, uh, patients go with it expecting that they will live longer and feel better and avoid the complications of diabetes. But again, the results of the studies do not support that belief. Now, it's possible that there may be a group of patients that will in fact benefit, uh, but our level of confidence in saying that to patients has, has significantly decreased by the results of these studies. So in terms of the return on investment for patients, put it this way, the effort to take uh, a pill for their cholesterol, to lower their blood pressure, to take their daily aspirin, and then to try to focus on their lifestyle and uh, avoid being overwhelmed by the frustrations of sugars that are all over the place or by the frustrations of having to check sugar and try to milk that extra drop of blood to get into the meter. Um, uh, and then doing all that work so that three months later when they come to see you, that number is just not at 7% or less, and so there's gonna be a little bit of a uh, scuffle with the clinician, you know, where it's not right. So all that, I think we can put aside and say it's time to focus on what, on what we know works. And what we know works is complex enough, is difficult enough, but if we are able to get it right, uh, patients will actually get a lot of benefit. For instance, cholesterol medication. If you give it to patients, which I, we've discussed, it's very effective. Uh, if you give it to patients, half of them are no longer taking them at two years' time. It takes about two years for the treatments to actually show, it at the level of the population, show a difference in mortality. So if we, we need to get that one right because that's effective and uh, it's not very expensive. Now there are generic uh, statins. So that's effective, it's very inexpensive, and it's low burden for the patient. Um, but they come to see us for diabetes and we spend a second on that and we spend the rest of the time on why the sugars are not right. Now the other exception to this is our patients who have very high blood sugars and there is no debate that if somebody has very high blood sugars they can benefit in terms of how they feel almost immediately by bringing their sugars down. So um, the, the key I think for treatment of diabetes is if you push too hard it's very difficult and they're going to have low blood sugar and nobody's potentially going to do well. If you let it all lose there are going to be people that are going to have very high blood sugars they are going to feel sick from that. So the question is, how do you manage it so that it will be about right in terms of both the effect of the treatment and how burdensome it is for the patients on the one hand. On the other hand, you continue to focus your attention on things that matter. That is probably misguided to take every patient with diabetes and push them to achieve tight glucose control and spending a tremendous amount of time and effort on the physician side to do it and on the patient side to do it, often with high degrees of frustration in addition to expense and and, call and, and burden of treatment. Um, instead of uh, getting, getting to where the patient can do something that's doable, implementable, something they can stick to that is feasible, is gonna, has been shown to cause tremendous benefit, uh, is less expensive, and to potentially re uh, keep them engaged and able to uh, uh, achieve better outcomes for themselves. And um, the and you say, well, why, why is that not possible now? And so the fundamental reason it's not possible is that clinicians are committed either by their understanding of the data or more likely by these policies um, of uh, achieving A1C less than 7% as a measure of the quality of your work, that they cannot afford to have a conversation with their patients in which they say, you know, the sugar control is not the key issue. The key issue is your overall health, and the things that impact your overall health are paying attention to your wellness, your lifestyle, and your cardiovascular risk reduction. The sugar thing, unless it's giving you symptoms, can wait. Um, we cannot have that conversation because patients, clinicians are being held accountable to a single measure of sugar to describe all that care for patients with diabetes. And that measure of sugar is so strict that it does not give any leeway to individualized care. Our results will suggest that uh, there is no uh, or very limited benefit from that approach and in fact an approach that focuses on the patient rather than on the numbers will be uh, potentially more beneficial.